Hello and welcome once again to Tales of the Wild, the podcast which explores the science of animal biology through stories. The goal of this podcast is to explore the inner workings of some of the most interesting species we share our planet with. Together we'll look at the peculiar ways in which many species live their lives and how each of them overcomes adversity, surviving to reproduce against all odds. This week our story takes us to a creature that I have a feeling not many of you will know about, and as usual, there will be many interesting scientific facts to impress your friends with along the way. The tale today is about a proud huntress desperate to impress her queen, military strategies with disastrous consequences, fairness and deception. Welcome to Tales of the Wild. Thick vines covered in moss hang lazily from twisted branches, which explode into numerous bright green leaves, shimmering in the light of the hot sun. Climbing plants make their way up every tree trunk, carrying uncountable perfectly spherical drops of water, which sparkle in the few rays of sun which have been able to penetrate the dense canopy above. The deafening sounds of stridulating crickets, cicadas, and the occasional strange calls of brightly coloured exotic birds seem to be the only things able to pierce through the thick, humid air. Gnarly holes embedded in the ancient tree trunks hide all but the tiny eyes of unknown inhabitants as they await the night. The unbearable heat and humidity of this environment has forced many animals in the jungle to become nocturnal or crepuscular, being active only at the peripheries of daytime. Our lone hunter revels in this environment, and the surroundings blur as she zooms past vast complex masses of vegetation scouting for her prey. Nearly all life forms capable of doing so scatter. She's widely detested in this place and she knows it. Actually, she rather enjoys this fact. Her wings make a deep low hum as she goes, and the mere sound seems to strike fear into those that hear her approach. She's on a quest. It is a quest for only the bravest individuals, because this Chinese volcanic island known as Henan is full of predators in various forms, and of particular concern to most are the numerous colonies of honeybees which inhabit the island. They will not tolerate any living being coming in close proximity to their precious harvest, which they've worked so hard to obtain. Our huntress, however, has little fear of most animals out here, and least of all honeybees. Except for the wild ones, that is. She did not know exactly what the wild ones were, or if they even existed, but she'd heard rumours that they knew ancient, mysterious combat techniques which could destroy even hornets. She suspected these rumours were not true. She is a black shield hornet, a very powerful and specialised hunter indeed. She's not just looking for any old insect to eat, but actually she's looking for a very particular quarry, and that comes in the form of the honeybees we've just mentioned. She hates them with an unrivaled passion. They're smaller than her and weaker than her, yet so numerous. It is an absolute insult that her kind and honeybees are so often confused. Can people not see the hairy bodies of the bees compared to the sleek, smooth bodies of hornets? If she had her way, she would wipe them all out of this jungle, every last one of them. She laughed to herself at the pathetic animals which are afraid of the bees because of their stings. If they wanted to encounter a real sting, she would be happy to show them. She had little concern for their defences, as she was simply too powerful, and what could they possibly do to her? She was once stung on her abdomen, but it was entirely painless, although rather embarrassing nonetheless, and after being certain that none of her hornet companions had seen, she remembered particularly enjoying biting the head off that overconfident individual, and watched as it fell to the ground with its mandible still twitching. 
It was unnecessary, of course, for these inferior creatures were so poorly designed that Mother Nature herself must also detest them. Unlike her sting, the sting of honeybees are barbed, which means after use they become stuck in the victim, and as the bee flies away, their entrails are ripped out of their bodies, and they die a miserable death. Kamikaze for the greater good, she laughed to herself. Honourable imbeciles. She paused her flight for a moment and came to land boldly right out in the open on one of the few bare stretches of branch which had been warmed by the sun. A terrified grasshopper made a bold and desperate leap off the branch to the forest floor where it was promptly eaten by a very lucky gecko who had been basking in a small spotlight of blinding sunlight on the tree roots. As he looked up to see if there were more free meals on the way, he saw the hornet and disappeared rapidly into the roots. A hornet smiled at this and took a moment to take in her surroundings. A few meters away, there was a cluster of orchids, not yet in bloom, but surely within a few days there would be a nectar meal opportunity for her there. Or perhaps they would attract some bees to the area, so she did not have to travel so far on these hunting expeditions. As she looked at the orchids, she felt a strange kind of foreboding running through her body. It was totally unexplainable. This was a perfect day for hunting, and there were no threats here. Indeed, what could threaten her in any case? She shook the feeling off and remained there motionless for a while, twitching her impressive antennae. As our black shield hornet cleaned herself with her forelegs, she marvelled at her own anatomy. Her black and yellow exoskeleton was looking particularly shiny in the sun this morning. It was made of chitin, but not the regular stuff that even those weak, wormy little caterpillars had. Hers was mixed with a protein matrix called sclerotin, together with calcium carbonate, the same stuff found in the shells of shellfish. This enforced chitin formed rigid plates which lay together in a flexible articulation of armour, much like the suits of armour worn by medieval knights. Good luck, honeybees, she thought to herself. She was fully defended. Okay, now to inspect her weapons. She stretched her jaw muscles, opening her massive serrated mandibles widely in a horizontal direction, and then she used her rear legs to wipe clean her 5mm sting. Her sting had evolved from an egg-laying tube called an ovipositor. You may have seen this structure in crickets or grasshoppers. It looks like a long black tail and is only present in the females. The hornet's wasp ancestors used their ovipositors, and I should point out that many parasitic wasp species still do, to lay eggs inside the bodies of dead insects. Over time, these ovipositor egg-laying tubes became sharper and serrated, and like something from a horror movie, some species developed the ability to administer an immobilizing venom into the host insect so that they provide a much fresher meal for the developing larvae inside them. Modern stinging wasps no longer use the ovipositor's egg-laying function. So I guess you're all wondering how the queen can sting and yet still lay eggs when her ovipositor egg-laying tube is now a venom needle. Well, give evolution a few million years and it can work these kinds of problems out. The reproductive system of the queen hornet is now totally separate from the sting and she lays eggs through another opening. A hornet was proud of her weapon, which only the females of her colony were blessed with. The males of her kind and other hymenoptera, the order including all bees, wasps and ants, which of course are very closely related, were entirely stingless and in her opinion, entirely useless. They don't contribute to foraging, nest maintenance or taking care of the larvae and they disappear halfway through the year to find females to start other nests. Good riddance, she thought, as she knew she would never be one of the select few to become queen. It was already too late for that. This was decided much earlier during the larval stage. Scientists don't know exactly how the selection process worked, but it is known that the larvae destined for royalty are fed greater quantities of protein. We also know that the males are produced by the queen simply not fertilizing the eggs, which means the individual has half of the number of chromosomes and becomes a male in a process called Aronotogy. 
Finally, she cleaned her wings and they sparkled in the light like polished fragments of mirror. She stretched out her whole body with pride. She was a devastating force for honeybees to contend with. A dragon amongst cattle. She could not count the number of bees she'd destroyed in her lifetime. If she had her way, she would slaughter any colony she found all by herself. She knew she was certainly capable of it. But hornets live by a code. If they find a honey beehive while scouting, they must report back to their nest and come back with a larger group so that others can share in the fun as they massacre the bees. After a few more minutes of rest and self-admiration, she launched herself from the branch, cutting through the thick heavy air and continuing her search for a nice big beehive to wipe out. She had no taste for bee flesh personally. She could not stomach it because of her thin waist. These days she's more interested in sweeter things, such as fruit or nectar from flowers. No, she was not in this to feed herself, but she had many hungry mouths to feed back at the nest, and those young killers-to-be had an endless appetite for bees. More specifically, they wanted bees that had been mashed up in the mouths of adult hornets. She loved nothing more than to return back to the nest with a crop full of those mashed up bees and feed the larvae and watch them grow fat. The larvae were also very generous, and when they had enough to spare, they would secrete droplets of an energy-rich mixture called Vespa Amino Acid Mixture, or VAM. The females of the hive would use this energy-rich mixture to give them endurance as they travelled around looking for more food. As a side note, this compound is actually commercially available and marketed to athletes who hope to gain some of the energy benefits that we see in these powerful insects that can travel up to 80 kilometers in a single day. One scientific paper has found it to be effective in increasing endurance in mice, and a further study at Ranford University found similar results in flies. The jury is out on whether it has any significant positive effects on humans, but it's certainly effective in fattening up larval hornets. So on she went on her quest, searching for bees. She remembered with great fondness the day when she and 30 of her sisters had wiped out an entire colony in the space of just a few hours. It was a tremendous day, and the colony of developing larvae had fed very well. Once they had chewed up as many as they could, they had left the bee box covered in the bodies of dying and deceased bees. She was actually on the way to one of the neighbouring bee boxes when something caught her eye, or more specifically, one of her five eyes. Hornets and wasps have two large compound eyes fragmented into cells called omitidia. In addition, they have three simple eyes, known as ocelli. These are highly light-sensitive organs that help with flight navigation at speed. If you've ever been bold enough to try and swat a wasp away from your lunch, this is how they react so quickly to the shadow of your approaching hand. However, when it comes to seeking out prey, they will use their much larger compound eyes. And that's what happened just this moment as she spotted a lonesome worker bee who must have strayed too far from the hive in search of nectar. She was the stereotypical busy bee flying from flower to flower, humming to herself without a care in the world other than working for her colony. She'd found a bush full of blooming bright blue flowers. Flowers, of course, are natural advertisements. They are the plant's way of trading nectar in exchange for the chance to spread their pollen to other neighbouring plants. Millions of years of evolution have given flowers a physical form which acts as both a billboard broadcasting their products and a suitable landing platform for their pollinators of choice. Many of them have very specific entries to ensure that they cover their very specific pollinators with as much pollen as possible, and others are much more general in their pollinator choice. There are no green flowers in nature, of course, because these would not stand out to the bees. Plant leaves are necessarily green due to the colour of chlorophyll, the green molecule which absorbs red and blue light and allows the plant to convert light energy into sugar. It doesn't absorb any green light, but reflects it, and that's why we and other animals see plants as mostly green. So flowers, like adverts, are designed to be noticed and stand out in a crowded marketplace. 
In a way, you can think of bees as flower engineers. Their preferences and senses have, over millions of years, shaped exactly what you see when you look at a flower, each with colours, shapes and smells favoured by the pollinators of those flowers. The bee was of course totally unaware of such things and simply wanted to collect nectar for her hive. Our hornet's blood started to boil with an excited kind of hatred, and she wasted no time in attacking the bee. The bee's hooked feet were ripped from the flower petal, and she hit the ground hard. She found herself grappling with a monster several times her size. She tried to defend herself and sting the hornet, but was already missing several limbs and could not orientate her abdomen towards the heaving and twitching muscle mass on top of her. Must protect the hive, the bee thought, and then within a second it was all over. Our hornet used her mandibles to mash up and swallow the remains of this sorry individual. The air smelt strongly of alarm pheromones. She must have been a little slower to kill this one than usual. She loved that smell, and often used it to find bees in trouble. She was considering waiting around to see if more bees would turn up to avenge their deceased sister, but then she remembered the code. She decided to head back with what she had and feed the little ones. She would come back later with her sisters to try and find the rest of the colony of this lonely bee. At the honey bee hive, it was business as usual. One of the workers had come back from a foraging trip and was clearly very excited. She landed in amongst a small number of her sisters and began to vibrate her abdomen excitedly. A few of her sisters began to gather around to see what all the commotion was about. She began what is known as the sacred waggle dance. This is the remarkable way in which bees communicate the whereabouts of good foraging spots to increase their collective efficiency of nectar foraging. She began to move in a straight line for about 5 centimeters while waggling her body left and right ferociously. More bees joined the group and watched, completely entranced. Once she got to the end of her straight line, she stopped waggling and moved in a clockwise semicircle back to the start of the waggle line and then repeated. This time, at the end she moved in an anti-clockwise semicircle back to the start. Incredibly, this behaviour is imprinted within the very DNA of the bee. As soon as they are adults, they can both perform and interpret this dance without ever having seen it before. So what does it mean? Well, the length of the straight line with the intense waggling signifies the distance to the flowers. It's been shown to be highly accurate, even up to distances of 6 kilometers away. The second piece of information in that dance is the direction. When the bee performs a waggle dance, the angle of the waggle line across the honeycomb tells the other bees the direction they must fly in relation to the sun. It is efficiency-saving communication like this which allows the colony to make up to 90 kilograms of honey per season. The other bees understood the message very clearly. There was an excellent foraging ground just 3.2 kilometers at 30 degrees to the right of the sun. Many of them set off immediately. After a small flourish to finish the dance, our honeybee takes a rest and then goes to inspect the honey cells after her long flight. Then came that terrible scent on the wind and she stopped immediately in her tracks. Alarm pheromones, the hive is in trouble. She watched as 50 or so of her sisters flew in the direction of the scent to investigate and took off to join them. It might be nothing, perhaps just a wild pig stumbling too close to the hive, or perhaps something worse. She met her sisters in the air and they swarmed together through the foliage. She thought more about what might await her Perhaps it's a bee-eater. Those birds are relentless and have picked off many of her sisters in the past. They are, however, relatively easy to deter in the face of a small group of angry honeybees. Perhaps it's not a bird. Could it be... No, that doesn't bear thinking about. 
She continued to fly in the direction of the alarm pheromones, and when they arrived at the location, which seemed to be where the scent was coming from, they saw nothing. There was nothing there. She looked around. No wild pig, no bee eaters. But then she noticed on a patch of dirt the broken disembodied limbs of one of her sisters. She froze as it dawned on her what this meant. There was only one type of predator which would leave remains of her kind like this. Hornets. She looked at her sisters and could see that they had come to the same realization. They were flying very slowly, twitching their antennae frantically, looking around for any threats. One of the younger recruits began to fire out alarm pheromones nervously. This was a terrible mistake given the circumstances, and the bees around her buzzed angrily. Time to retreat, they thought in unison. They began to fly back the way they had come. They would be much safer at the hive. But then, no more than 20 meters in front of them, eclipsed in the blinding rays of sun, ten shadowy figures rose into their flight path. Each of the ten shadows consisted of a huge body dangling lazily between two enormous and powerful wings. It was too late, the bee thought. They clustered together and flew to the hornets, knowing full well that this was the end. They would do what they could for the hive. You can imagine how this battle went. Not a single bee remained alive, and it was all over too quickly. Our hornet was the centre of admiration as she stood there with the others, munching up the remains of the bodies of fifty foolish bees they had ambushed. She had done very well indeed, and the queen would surely be impressed with her efforts. It was an excellent start to the day, and the hornets were very excited by the alarm pheromones that filled the air. Their senses were sharp, and their bodies shook. Their mood had shifted into a sort of killing frenzy state, and they were desperate to find more bees. One of her sisters suggested travelling in the direction the bees had been going to try and find the hive. Filled with bloodlust, they all agreed and travelled as a group in the direction they'd seen the bees retreating earlier. They eventually discovered a small wooden bee box full of bees and their larvae. It was a total killing spree. They killed far more bees than they were able to eat that day. Once they were stuffed full of bee bodies, they headed back to the nest to feed their hungry precious larvae who were going to fatten up like never before. The queen was very pleased indeed, and as she was praising the group to the shock of our hornet, her sister took full credit for finding the hive and directing the group. Our hornet was furious at the betrayal. It was she that had found those bees that led to the discovery of the hive, not her sister. She immediately flew out of the nest so as not to react in the presence of her royal highness. I will show her, she thought, and she flew off into the thick jungle. The bee boxes that they normally raided were not doing so well these days, probably on account of so many raids, and so she decided to explore to find new feeding grounds. If she could find a suitable hunting ground by herself, surely that would impress her queen, and this time she would keep it to herself. She flew high over the canopy to have a look at her surroundings. There, that was an unexplored region. It was a natural depression in the land which was full of a heavy mist that had descended to its base. Her sisters had talked of this place but never visited through fear of the wild ones, but she still could not believe those rumours. The queen would be impressed by her bravery. She flew rapidly in the direction of this area. It was about 20 kilometres to the east and she flew over the trees to save time. Once she entered the mist she had to slow down. Her senses were not so sharp in these conditions, and pheromones did not travel so freely. This place was unfamiliar and different to the other areas of the jungle that she'd explored. This persistent mist had resulted in a large number of different water-loving plants living here. They had long and spindly branches, and a dark green moss was covering every surface. 
The cicadas were screaming loudly into the mist, as if they had to be louder to compensate for the thick air. Unlike crickets, which rub their wings together to make a sound, cicadas produce this sound by vibrating their ribs at a very high speed within an organ called a timbal. It created a very special atmosphere in this part of the jungle. A hornet landed on a leaf to rest and have a look at her surroundings. She spotted some rotting fruit on the ground, probably the leftovers from a passing group of gibbons. She was hungry, but the fruit was already buzzing with a cloud of wasps, and she did not want to associate with those inferiors. Actually, hornets are in fact wasps. They are one and the same. There is no official difference in classification. The only difference is in the size, and the fact that while most species of wasp are solitary, apart from those that we're most familiar with, all hornets are social, or rather, eusocial. Eusociality is when a social species has a caste system, with some individuals being physiologically distinct from one another to help them to perform their specific roles, for example, foraging, breeding, or laying eggs. Eusocial insects include many ant species, termites, and even a mammal species that many of you will know, the very charming naked mole rats. Our hornet looked for other food items. There were some orchids blooming overhead, but that strange bad feeling she had felt in the morning crept over her once more as she looked at them. No, she thought. Bees first, dinner later, and she continued scouting. There, as she looked through the mist and saw that familiar shadow of the creatures she loved to hate. She was very excited, and her instincts put her body into attack mode. She shot towards the bee and crushed it instantly with her mandibles. This time she was very quick, and the bee had not omitted any alarm pheromones. She started scouting for the hive. She thought it was going to be very difficult in this place, but she soon picked up a pheromone trail and saw it. It was in the old crooked stumpy remains of a tree that had been struck by lightning many years ago. Strange, she thought. This was not the type of hive she was used to invading. In any case, a bee is a bee. She shot towards the hive but was promptly met by a couple of bees which flew towards her on the way. She was about to destroy them when they landed on the ground in front of her and started vibrating. She laughed. They must be terrified at the sight of me, she thought, and she moved in to put them out of their nervous misery. However, as she approached, they just vibrated more vigorously. Something primal and instinctual was tingling in her body. There was some significance to this strange behavior. She landed on the ground, a meter away from them, and studied them more closely. What was happening here? She had never seen bees do this before, and why was she feeling some kind of fear? She normally has no fear of bees. Oh, these are not bees. These are different. Wild ones. The wild ones exist, she thought, and they are bees. They didn't look so different to the honeybees that she's used to, and she decided she would destroy them all. As the thought dawned on her, a shadowy mass rose from behind the two guard bees. It was a giant ball of bees and was moving towards her rapidly. She got a grip of herself and flew to the guard bees, decapitating them both within a second, and then she flew up to meet these aggressors. She would show the queen what she was capable of, and bring back the mashed up remains of wild ones. That would surely impress her. She flew to the edge of the mass and began picking off bees one by one. This was easy, she thought. Bee bodies dropped to the ground below as she killed them with her mandibles. At first there were 10 dead bees on the ground, then 50, then 100. But the ball of bees was not getting any smaller, and she realized some of them had flown past her. Strange, she thought, as she ripped the head off another bee. The bees had surrounded her. That was fine. They could not penetrate her armor with their stings anyway. Then she noticed something unusual. It was getting quite warm in this dense cloud of bees. In fact, much too warm for her comfort. She decided to exit the mass and fight them from the periphery again. But every time she tried to move, the bees moved with her and she could not escape the heat, which was now like a furnace. 
She watched a few bees drop out of the sky, surely dying from overheating. She was exhausted from fighting in this inferno, but was determined to carve a path out of this buzzing ball of bees so that she could escape. She was getting weaker and weaker. And then everything went black. I want to pause the story here for a second and explain that for the purposes of entertainment, I do sometimes use a little creative license with biology in these tales, although mainly it's just to give the animals character so that we can relate to them. In this case though, unbelievable though it is, this is exactly what happens in nature. The hornet in our tale was used to attacking western honeybees, which were introduced to Hainan because they produce more honey than the native bees, which in this story we've been calling the wild ones but actually they're called Asian hive bees. Because the western honeybees have not evolved in this environment, they have not evolved any defense against black shield hornets at all. The Asian hive bee, however, which evolved alongside the hornets, has developed impressive defense strategies. They really will send out a few guards who will vibrate to warn the hornets. They don't want to have a battle unless it's necessary, and nor do the hornets in most cases. They only do this with hornets and not with other larger predators. If the warning fails, they will exhibit a behavior called balling, where they form a dense ball of bees and raise the local CO2 levels dramatically along with the air temperature by beating their wings very quickly. Scientists have found that these temperatures within the mass can reach up to 46 degrees. Some of the bees will die in the process, but they are much more heat resistant than hornets, and hornets cannot survive in those conditions at all. It's quite incredible that these complex behaviours have evolved in such simple organisms. Amazingly, she survived. When she awoke she was tangled in some water plants and realised that she must have dropped into a small stream which saved her life. Bees hate water, she thought. She cursed her stupidity for ignoring the ancient code. She should have gone back to recruit her sisters to help with this mission. She crawled out of the water's edge and climbed onto a small dead branch to dry. There was no sun here and the air was very humid. Her whole body was aching and she felt incredibly weak and her vision was blurry. She should go back to her sisters and get some food, but she was too proud to go back empty-handed. If I can just bring back the body of a wild one, the queen will be so pleased with me, she thought. I just need to find one alone and avoid alerting the whole hive. She shuddered at that thought. It was getting dark, so she had to act quickly now. Without fully waiting for her wings to dry, she flew with the last bit of energy she had up into the air and began looking around for pheromones. There, a strong waft of bee alarm pheromones drew her in the right direction and then she saw it. It was the unmistakable shape of a wild one. It was feeding on the nectar of an orchid. She shot towards it at full speed, determined not to alert the whole hive. She bashed hard into the orchid flower and grasped around for the bee, but there was nothing there. She was covered in a powdery pollen. Now she really couldn't go back to the nest empty-handed. She looked ridiculous. She looked around. There it was again, it had landed on another orchid. She took off and flew in a straight line into the orchid and bit at the bee. Again she was covered in a plume of pollen, but there was no bee to be found. It was there. She flew, getting weaker and smashed with less force this time into another orchid, and the same thing happened. It is not known what happened to our hornet. Some people say she's still there flying from orchid to orchid looking for a bee that doesn't exist. What is known is that she was not mad. She had fallen into the hands of a trickster, and the name of that trickster is Dendorbium sincens, the bee orchid. It has evolved not only to look like a bee, but amazingly, it even emits the same molecular chemicals that bees do when they're being attacked. But instead of finding a nice juicy bee in the flower, the hornets become covered in pollen, which they spread to other orchids. Normally flowers must pay for such a service with nectar, but this plant is a botanical charlatan. 
This orchid species is only found on the island of Henan, and without the existence of this particular species of hornet, the orchid would cease to exist itself. While the trade between bees and flowers keeps both living, the flowers of these killer hornets will take without giving. So there we have another episode of Tales of the Wild. I think we covered quite a lot in this episode and we learnt about the relationship between bees and hornets, how bees communicate with one another and the chemical signals that bees use to signal to others when they're in danger and how one species of plant has evolved to exploit this um, chemical signal and use it to trick the hornets into pollinating their flowers. If you enjoyed this tale, then I think the next one will not disappoint. In next week's episode, we will embark on a perilous journey to the Arctic tundra, where very few species can survive. A not-so-gentle giant inhabits this hostile environment, and actually thrives there, although not without risk. Thanks very much for listening, and if you enjoy these, please consider supporting the podcast either by leaving a review, sharing it with others, or consider becoming one of the podcast patrons. You can follow the links in the description to see how to do this. See you next time on Tales of the Wild. Mm -hmm.